the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the Lord. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Sanctify us in your truth, your word. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Testament reading for the 12th Sunday after Pentecost is from Isaiah chapter 51. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and in the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion, he comforts all her waste places, and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation, for a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath, for the heavens vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will now read Psalm 138 responsibly by whole verse. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. And they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his promise to me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. 
Do not forsake the work of your hands. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle is from Romans, chapters 11 and 12. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern that what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, do not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not, have, do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant, or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. We confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon text comes from the epistle lesson. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Peter Gomes was the pastor of the campus chapel at Harvard University until his death a number of years ago. He wrote a number of books, and at times he can be pretty critical of the population there at Harvard. He notes a link between knowledge and arrogance. As you might imagine, there are a lot of very smart people among the students and faculty there, and they can be, many of them, pretty full of themselves. Gomes, however, writes about one day at Harvard when nearly all that con collective conceit was suspended, if only for a couple of hours. Nelson Mandela had come to Harvard to receive a, an honorary doctorate. You recall Mandela is credited with, in large part, for helping put an end to South African apartheid in, in a peaceful way. Gomes writes, I watched all of us transformed, noisy, pushy, self-centered, conceited undergraduates and graduate students became quiet and calm, thinking absolutely about somebody else for a change. And my pompous, pushy, arrogant colleagues, all of whom are always fighting for every square inch of turf on that stage, were overwhelmed by the magnitude of the person in our midst. And for a moment, we were all changed. We all went back to what we were by six o'clock, that can't be helped. But for an instant, it pleased me to realize that the young, raised on a diet of cheap and promiscuous celebrity, could at last recognize a humble hero when they were privileged to see one. And unlike at commencement, when the unrestrained and competitive egos of the candidates for degrees turned the yard into a barnyard, on Friday, we were all as one, and our only thought and care was to share something of this great man. It was extraordinary, and those of us who were there will never forget it. The sin of arrogance. I submit it's not just a problem at Harvard. It can be a problem right here in Little Watertown, right here at Good Shepherd, a problem for each of us. Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome, for the, by, by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. That is, there's no room for arrogance or conceit in the life of the Christian. It's a theme Paul keeps coming back to. In Philippians 2, he writes, Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others better than yourself. It's not that everyone else is superior or more talented, not at all. Rather, Christian love sees everyone else as being worthy of being served. It's the command, love your neighbor as yourself. Paul goes on to say, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or held on to, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness, 
being in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. That's the one we're following. That's the one we want to imitate. The one who humbled himself and became a suffering servant for all. The Bible is very consistent on the topic. The book of Proverbs especially has some surprisingly strong words to say about arrogance. From, Psalm, some, from Proverbs 16, everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. Apparently the arrogance of man is diametrically opposed to the nature of God. Of course it goes back to Genesis 3 where Adam and Eve wanted to be esteemed as God is esteemed. But Jesus taught us to remove ourselves from the center of the world and put others there instead. Whoever would be great among you, he said, must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The problem is arrogance and conceit have become standard fare in our culture. From Little League soccer players all the way up to the White House. And I submit we're pretty much okay with it. We think of it sort of as a minor sin, not a big deal. Maybe a little bit too much comp confidence. A peccadillo, nothing to be too concerned about. Not in comparison to murder, for instance. Or we're all far more interested and concerned about bigotry these days than we are about arrogance. Because bigotry is a sin that's easy enough to pin on others, right? While arrogance is a sin that's a little harder to spot in ourselves, a little easier to deny in ourselves. But the truth is, as the descendants of Adam and Eve, we would all deify ourselves if we could. Luther wrote, this forbidden apple still lies heavy in everybody's stomach, causes constant belching, and will not be digested. For even the true saints still have something of the core of the apple in their bellies. As we can't shake our desire to want to be like God, to want to be esteemed like God is esteemed. Moreover, pride has a way of spoiling every gift that God gives. Luther wrote, if a young girl is pretty but becomes proud and looks down on others, pride spoils her beauty. How true. But it works that way with every gift that God gives. I knew some music majors at the University of Wisconsin when I was a student there. And I remember being so surprised and impressed and admittedly a little envious. They were my own age, and yet they had so excelled in music. How did they do it? How did they get so good so young? But the moment I sniffed a little arrogance is the same moment that that music didn't sound so good anymore. Pride spoils every gift. Paul deals with it head on. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries, all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have love, I'm nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing nothing. Love is patient, kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant. I think the main reason God's word comes down so hard on arrogance is because it's God's aim to save. And it's very hard even for the Lord to save the one who is arrogant. The arrogant man is already full of himself. He has no room for grace. He cannot deflate or humble himself enough to beg for grace. 
Only when we empty ourselves or are emptied of any other hope, only then is there room for God to give us his gifts of forgiveness and salvation. Luther wrote, in God's presence, all must tuck their tails and be glad that they can gain forgiveness. For if God does not forgive without stopping, we are all lost. So, maybe this sin of arrogance isn't so minor after all. In Mark 7, Jesus gives 13 characteristics of those who are outside God's favor, with arrogance being considered right alongside sexual immorality and murder. In Proverbs 6, of the seven things God hates, haughty eyes is the first one on the list. After all, those who commit murder often come to the point of deep grief and contrition for their sin and therefore can readily be forgiven. But those who are arrogant often feel no need for forgiveness and it's difficult to teach them otherwise. This morning we have the pleasure of commissioning, commissioning and installing a young man into the teaching ministry. We are truly blessed to have Stephen Burnow on our faculty. We often pray here, right, that the Lord raise up a new generation of capable pastors and, and teachers. The harvest is white, the workers are few. Stephen is an answer to that prayer, and so we should give thanks to God for that answer. There aren't too many in Stephen's generation who are choosing to go, in, to go into church work anymore. In a few years, it promises to be quite a problem. So we are blessed to have Stephen with us. His dad is a pastor. His mom is a teacher. Uh, they're with us this morning. Stephen comes from Cortland, Minnesota, um, uh, more recently from Concordia University, Wisconsin. He's one of nine siblings, and most of them serving as pastors or, or teachers, I think seven of the nine. But I, I know Stephen well enough to know it's not familial tradition that motivates him. He truly wants to serve in the name of Jesus. He truly wants to make a difference in the lives of God's people here at Good Shepherd. He's going to be good at it. But Stephen, there are some hard realities there are some people, especially among adults, but also among middle schoolers, who are really difficult to teach. <coughs> Proverbs 26 says, Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool. Such people, such people, they're not teachable. They heed no warnings. They're cocksure and confident in themselves and their own wisdom and strength, their own resources. What they don't know, what they will not accept if told, is that they are vulnerable as a little lamb in the middle of the forest. Therefore, Proverbs 16 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Our psalm today says, The Lord regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. It's not that the Lord is keeping his distance. It's that the haughty won't allow him in. We should take the sin of arrogance more seriously than we do. Martin Luther wrote, If you want to go to hell, then continue to be proud. There you have it. Finally, let's think on Jesus. <coughs> God's Son, Lord, Savior. But one thing he was not was arrogant. If I had even the tiniest fraction of his wisdom, I'd need a dump truck to haul around my ego. But I th the think of it, you never see Jesus being arrogant or haughty. What we see is a certain humility. And he wasn't just playing at it. He was truly humble, humble enough to surround himself with sinners and tax collectors, humble to welcome the children, humble to eat our lowly food, to laugh with us, to walk dusty roads with us, humble enough 
to take on our sin as if it belonged to him and not us. I mentioned Proverbs 16 earlier. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. God's son, Jesus, with our arrogance on his shoulders, becomes an abomination to the Lord on the cross. At all other times, he's God's beloved son, right? On the cross, he's an abomination. He willingly became detestable, despicable, repugnant, vile, abhorrent, loathsome, not just to man, but to the Lord, to the Father. Can you imagine God's love for us is so great that he takes the filth of our sin as his own. He's so humble in spirit that he utterly debases himself. He says to you, you're no longer sinner. I am. I'm putting your sin on my shoulders. You haven't sinned. I have. You've not been arrogant. I have been. And am. I have all your sins are on me, not on you. You know, the devil, he'll say the exact opposite. He's the great accuser. So he will say to you, you're no Christian. You're just a sham, a great <coughs> sinner, and I own you. You're condemned to hell already. When the devil accuses you like that, you tell him his argument is with Jesus who has washed you by his blood and declared you innocent, righteous. Jesus still loves us. His death still counts for us. Still wipes clean the record. It still redeems us from sin and death and the devil. And his promises are still good, still valid. Thanks be to God. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
At this time, I ask Stephen to come forward along with our entire faculty <coughs> on either side of Stephen. I mentioned uh, Stephen's parents are here. Pastor, come on right up here, Stephen. <laughs> um, 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 Pastor Wayne Bernal and I want to say Donna. <laughs> um, they're here and your brother Samuel. And uh, Samuel looks just like Stephen but with a beard. Or maybe it's the other way around. You look just like <laughs> Stephen, Samuel but without a beard. <laughs> In any event, uh, let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, according to the church's usual order, Stephen Burnow has been called to the office of teacher at Good Shepherd Lutheran School. This office has been established in love by the church to support the office of the holy ministry and to assist and strengthen Christian fathers and mothers in their God-given responsibility to bring up their children in the nurture and instruction of the Lord. Stephen has been prepared for this office by prayer and study. He has been examined and declared ready to undertake this sacred responsibility in public trust. Hear the word of God concerning this office. By the grace given to you, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. And from Matthew chapter 20, Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. For whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. One more from Colossians 3. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you are indeed called into one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Do you believe and confess the canonical books of the Old and New Testaments to be the inspired word of God and the only infallible rule of faith and practice? Yes, I believe and confess the canon canonical scriptures to be the inspired word of God and the only infallible rule of faith and practice. Do you believe and confess the three ecumenical creeds, namely the Apostles, the Nicene, the Athanasian creeds, as faithful testimonies to the truth of the Holy Scriptures? And do you reject all the errors which they condemn? Yes, I believe and confess the three ecumenical creeds because they are in accord with the Word of God. I also reject all the errors they condemn. Do you confess the unaltered Augsburg Confession to be a true exposition of the Holy Scripture and a correct <coughs> exhibition of the doctrine of the Evangelical Lutheran Church? And do you confess that the apology of the Augsburg Confession, the small and large catechisms of Martin Luther, the small called articles, the treaties on the power and primacy of the Pope, and the form formula of Concord, as these are contained in the Book of Concord, are also in agreement with this one scriptural faith? Yes, I make these confessions my own because they are in accord with the word of God. Do you solemnly promise faithfully to serve God's people in the office of teacher in accordance with Holy Scripture and with these confessions? Yes, I promise with the help of God. Will you, trusting in God's care, seek to grow in love for those you serve? Strive for excellence in your skills and adorn the gospel of Jesus Christ with a godly life? Yes, I promise with the help of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you have heard the confession and solemn promise of Stephen, who has been called to the office of teacher in the church. I ask you now, 
in the presence of God, will you receive him, show him fitting love and honor, and support him by your gifts and fervent prayer? If so, then answer, we will with the help of God. We will with the help of God. The Almighty and most gracious God strengthen and assist you always. Are you ready and willing to assume this office and work? I am. Stephen Bernal, I commission you to the office of teacher and install you to Good Shepherd Lutheran School in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Please stand. Gracious and most merciful God, we thank you for providing faithful men and women in your church to assist and support the office of the Holy Ministry and its work among us. Grant your Holy Spirit to Stephen and adorn him with wisdom and power from on high. Incline both young and old to godliness and obedience and let them so benefit by instruction in your Holy Word that they may serve you all their days and finally obtain eternal life through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A question for the rest of the faculty. Are you ready and willing to resume your teaching ministry at Good Shepherd Lutheran School? If so, we are. We are. Let us pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, you've blessed us with the joy and care and education of children. To that end, we thank you for this school, for those who planned its beginnings, built its halls, managed its resources, and for those who teach and volunteer in its classrooms. We thank you for the students of our school, for the gifts and skills you've already given them, for their talents and interests, and for their parents who value Christian education. Bless, we pray you, this coming school year. Help our students at Good Shepherd and at all the other schools in our community to continue developing their talents, not just for themselves, but for the welfare of their neighbors and to your honor and glory. Give them to know that which is worth knowing, to love that which is worth loving, to praise that which pleases you most, to esteem that which is precious to you, to spurn whatever is evil in your sight. Give patience and strength to the teachers of this school and to all the teachers in our, in our community. Be their teacher and friend, their light and strength. Give them the habit of your humility, the courage of your truth, the comfort of your love, the gentleness of your compassion. Help them to love you in truth and serve you with joy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace and joy, in the most merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bless and strengthen you for faithful service in his name. Amen. You may return to your seats. Actually, we haven't taken the offerings yet, have we? We should probably do that. <laughs> Let's receive the offerings, and if you would, take a moment to sign in on the worship attendance register.
In our prayers, we celebrate with Bob and Gretchen Martins their 51st wedding anniversary, and we um, um, pray uh, in celebration of the birth of a son, Bentley, to Cassidy and, and Lucas Hartwig. Um, the grandparents are Mark and Amy. We pray for those who are sick, for Jean Leidendorf recovering from surgery, for Lou Ryder, Lynn Troike, Laverne Neuenfeldt, all, all three of whom are in hospice care. We pray for David Succo, Bonnie Simon, John Newton. We pray, we have a very sick little boy in our congregation right now and in our school, a, a five-year-old kindergartner, um, Landon Zelik has been diagnosed uh, with cancer. Uh, he had emergency brain surgery on uh, Saturday of last week. Um, he's at Children's Hospital in Madison for at least the next three months. Um, so we want to keep him in, in our prayers and his, his family. Um, we pray also for those serving in the armed forces, for Jeremy Rolstad, Jared Pyrick, Kevin Rollert, Zachary Krieger, and Jim Rubaki. Please stand for prayer. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the gift of divine peace and of pardon. With all our heart, with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Christian Church here and scattered throughout the world, for the proc proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the sick and dying, and for those who care for them, for Jean, Lou, Lynn, Laverne, David, Bonnie, John, Landon, and those whom we name in our hearts. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For Bob and Gretchen and for all the marriages of our church, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For Cassidy and Lucas, for all new parents, for Bentley, for all infants and young children, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For Jeremy, Jared, Kevin, Zachary, and Jim, and for all those who serve in the armed forces, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the spirit of humility in our marriages, in our families, at the workplace, in the community, in the church, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Finally, for these and for all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty and everlasting Father, you give your children many blessings, even though we are undeserving. In every trial and temptation, Grant us steadfast confidence in your loving kindness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my heavenly Father, 
through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Christ has been raised from the Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God, the almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. Please be seated. One uh, additional announcement. Last year, we ended the school year with 89 children. As uh, I, I heard last this last week, we have 117 enrolled this next year. So we're so grateful for that. Um, Amy Gromowski gave me the, the list of names and highlighted the, the, those students in yellow who are new to us, and there was a whole lot of yellow on that list. Uh, we're thankful for that. This is a new record for Good Shepherd, and uh, praise God. Um, the closing hymn, 857. <laughs> 